it is a uh, blessing, a privilege, and a, a pleasure for us to be able to gather together as the body of Christ, to sing his praises, to hear his word. So everybody go ahead and come on in, and I will pray as we start off our time this morning for the church. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your work in the world, your, your word out to us. Father, thank you for sending your son into the world to redeem um, a bride out for himself, the church. Jesus, thank you for your obedience to your father in all things, um, coming and living the righteous life um, that we should have lived, that was your design for us, and going willingly uh, to the cross to bear our penalty, um, to grant forgiveness and rising again so that that salvation um, is given, that you intercede now on our behalf, seated at the right hand of your Father. Holy Spirit, thank you for opening our eyes um, to that, granting life and giving new hearts um, to us in the gospel so that we now, we in you, we live and move and have our being. And uh, Father, thank you for gathering your people here. And Lord, I pray now that as we gather, as we sing your praises, that you would work transformation in our hearts to make us a more happy, holy, and helpful people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Let's stand.
astounded by your mercy and love. Our hands are lifted high in surrender. Your grace for me is always thank you so much for your love and your grace and lord you are the lord of lords and the king of kings and you are a good god and so we can trust in you and place our faith in you and lord we know that if we have the if we have faith as small as a mustard seed lord that we could move mountains we can, tell, we can tell a mountain to move, and it will move. Um, Lord, help us to increase our faith. And Lord, may you be glorified in our lives.
promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never failed me. Promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never failed me. God, we thank you so much for your faithfulness. You are a God that we can place our trust in. Whatever you say has come to pass or will come to pass, Lord. We thank you so much for your love and for your grace. Loving such sinners that we are and still wanting to spend eternity with us. Being covered by your blood. God, I pray that you continue to speak to us this morning. Open our hearts to hear from you. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. All right. It, isn't it so good, church, that we get to gather and we get to do this, but there is a way that we are in, in doing this. We're spiritually united with every faithful church of God all over the planet that is doing the same thing. You know, I, I love it. It's wonderful to gather and sing his praises. Um, children and youth, um, you are dismissed to go to your classes, but youth in particular, I want to say to you, um, next week, we're starting that series of classes on apologetics, and I think it will be especially helpful and applicable to you as you're going into your classes and into college. Everyone is invited to that. It's not a youth-specific or adult-specific thing. That's starting up next week, 9 to 10 in that hour. Uh, it'll be in Classroom D. And so it's the next three Sundays following, so I invite all of you youth to that. So you're dismissed. Let's give a round of thanks to those that are serving our children and the youth. Amen. Amen. And um, we've been highlighting a ministry of the church right before the sermon for a handful of weeks now. And for that, I would like to invite up Mike Stringer. He's going to share with us about the spiritual growth ministry. Good morning, church. Um, of course, my name is Mike Stringer. As you can you hear me. Hmm. It's on. Just it's on. Up close. Hello. Better? So, um, okay. Um, I've been serving on the ministry council for about a year, and my area is supposed to be in uh, helping to um, uh, develop the spiritual growth of the church. So, this past year, what we did is we um, kind of introduced it to the Bible app, which helps us to get into the Word of God. Um, that last year's focus trying to get more into the Word of God and in prayer. Um, so we have the Bible app, and we also have some um, daily breads on the um, back table there. So these are ways for us to get involved, get into the Word of God on a daily basis to hear what God has to say to us. Um, the second one is in getting into prayer. So we've had uh, prayer on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m., and it has been growing and seeing more people there. Um, I didn't make it today, but I, was it good? It was. Okay, good. And then um, we also have, um, uh, what we started doing is uh, corporate prayer. Um, once a month, we're having uh, prayer as a body. So that's been good, too, very good in, in hearing. And I'm just coming before God, and I'm laying our requests down and hearing from him and getting direction from him. Um, and also, I think what has started also is the leaders have, or the staff has having a weekly prayer as well. Um, so now, for the last couple of months, we've been I've meeting with the pastors, um, I think Lynette joined one of our meetings um, by just God's providence, and um, 
and also um, um, kind of discuss with the ministry council and with the elders of how to grow the church. So some of the things, kind of questions say, okay, well, how do we grow spiritually? Um, so out of that, um, um, looking at all the things, five things kind of came out of that. Um, I guess I can summarize maybe three things. One, it's a, it's a matter of the heart. Two um, is education. And three, support. So a matter of the heart. So out of the heart, um, we have, um, uh, it requires the Holy Spirit to do the work. It's not us doing the work, otherwise it's just us doing it. Um, and, and, but it's, it's a matter of the Spirit. So um, the leaders have, are praying for the body. Um, we are also, um, yes, as we have the corporate prayer, um, praying that the Holy Spirit will do a work in us to revive us, to um, help our faith to grow. Um, another area of that is um, if we have the Holy Spirit at work, but we have to have that desire to grow. Um, so we're praying that we would also have that desire. We can um, do this and that, but if we don't want it to grow, then, of course, it won't happen. And um, uh, my daughters left. I had um, example my daughters. Um, I challenged them um, to grow spiritually. And one of them, uh, for the youth retreat, I asked them both, pray about it. One of them said, okay, I'll pray about it. She did, and she said, God said that I should do it, but I really don't want to. But she took that step of faith and did that. So she was willing to do it. She has a heart that's willing to, serve, to, to learn. And the other one said, um, I don't want to pray because I know what God's going to say. So she didn't. So you see the, the difference of, of I have a heart that's willing to grow. So for us to grow, we need to have that heart that's willing to do that. Um, after that, um, uh, we need education, training. So um, besides um, getting into the Word of God and, and being taught the knowledge of the truth of God's Word, also um, being trained. Um, getting mentored, um, getting mentors. So if anybody here is interested or has been a mentor, um, you know, come talk to me. Um, we like to have mentors and those that want to be mentored as well. Um, so um, another area is uh, support. So um, how can we support you in growing your spiritual faith? It'd be counseling, um, different areas. So um, in this in this ministry, I'm trying to figure out um, best ways that we can grow. So um, how GC2 can help in this area and um, how to implement them. So a couple of things coming up is um, I think in the next couple of months, they're planning to talk about some um, uh, maybe controversial topics, Bible studies about controversial topics. Um, and how do we relate to that to people that may ask us about that? What does the Bible say about that? Um, and then in the summer, there's going to be, um, after the small groups are done, we have another time that we're going to have, ask others that have never led before, maybe, um, will be willing to step up and try to lead something um, and uh, as a whole body and, and really grow. So, um, so anyway, our, we are excited to see what God will do this year in growing us spiritually, um, that he, the Spirit will work in our hearts and uh, um, challenge us to you know, step out of faith. This guy wrote this book, um, uh, I think his name was Ortberg. Um, if you want to walk on water, you got to get out of the boat. So how is God going to spare us on to do that? Um, so thank you. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, a, a disciple, um, that, that word um, has, um, it means a, a learner, a follower. The, the closest kind of equivalent that we have today is an apprentice. And we're all apprentices to Jesus. And so we need to learn from him, see it modeled in him, look to his word to, to learn from him, and, and then follow him in it. If we're only heaping up knowledge, we're not apprentices. You know, there's putting it into practice. And that is ultimately um, for our, our good or our best. Um, let's pray again, and then we'll um, look to the word. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the blessing of gathering with a, a church and being here with your people, having so many um, different people that are involved, serving with their, their time and their, their skills, their, their talents, the, the gifts that you've given. Um, thank you for the, the generosity of this church, the, the welcoming um, nature and attitude of it. I, I pray that you continue to work us more and more into the image of your Son. Um, and that we would gather around each other and support one another in going through this life. And we would also reach out to the people around us, that you would grow us in maturity and in number to your great glory and for the good of all the peoples. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and open on up in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, if you would, please. Um, the title that I gave um, this sermon is Thick Skin and Tender Hearts. 
some essentials for faithfulness. We all want to be thought of as credible, as capable, and as significant. Uh, We don't want people to believe we're liars or that we're weak, that we're deceivers, nobodies, charlatans, fakes. We try to avoid even the appearance of being like that. Now, the the best way to go about that is expressed um, out in our lives by living in line with 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. It says, abstain from every uh, form or every appearance of evil. And 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, which says, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now, if, if we're pursuing that, um, that is the best way to go about it. But sadly, the desire to avoid being seen as a liar or a cheat or things like that, that's pursued sometimes by just trying not to get caught rather than actually having the substance of integrity. The, the desire for significance also doesn't always lead to a pursuit of doing what's truly meaningful, but sometimes it leads to rather um, a seeking of notoriety or just worldly recognition. One of the the big life questions we have to answer as Christians in order to live for the glory of God when there are so many other counterfeit options out in the world and they're out there as potential options for us, we have to answer the question, will I be faithful? Or to say it in a, a few other ways, will I do what is right and best even when no one is watching? Will I live with integrity when it's easier to do otherwise or when it's more profitable to do otherwise? Will I be faithful even when it makes me look weak in the eyes of others? Will I be faithful when everything goes my way and life is easy? Will I be faithful when my life comes into a season of extra fruitfulness and abundance? Will I be faithful, period? Paul's answer to that question in all of its forms was an emphatic yes for the glory of God as worship to God, yes. He, he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 2, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 2 saying, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Paul sought to serve God faithfully with integrity in everything, but it didn't mean that everything went well for him. It didn't mean that he had an easy life. It didn't mean that people always appreciated that integrity and faithfulness in him. Um, When Paul's writing this letter, he's responding to a situation where the Corinthians were not appreciating his faithfulness and his integrity. And so Paul Um, In this passage that we're going to look through, he rehearses how he's proved his genuineness and his integrity to them, and he calls them to respond rightly to that. So let's take a look at our passage for this morning and just see how it played out with Paul and the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm going to read from verse 1 through 13. Please follow along. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain, For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you, and in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, in hardships, in distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots, in hard works, sleepless nights, and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit and in sincere love, in truthful speech and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and on the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything." We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak 
As to my children, open wide your hearts also. Amen. Amen. When Paul is um, talking about his ministry and how he's commended himself to the Corinthians, um, how he's proven his genuineness and his faithfulness, he, he gives a, a list of nine hardships that he's experienced. They, they could be grouped into these three sort of categories, where the first one would be sort of like general suffering. Um, the second is suffering that he endured at the hands of others. And then the third category of these hardships would be sufferings that he endured because of his self-discipline or because of his pursuit in ministry. The, the first group we see is um, in verse, excuse me, um, in verse 4. It says, rather as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, in hardships, and distresses. This first group of things, troubles, hardships, distresses, they're, they're general terms. They have a, a whole lot of overlap. I'm not sure he's actually referring to specific things. There are so many different things that we could read about in the book of Acts or in Paul's letters that could fall into the category of the first group. There, there are troubles that come from a life lived with faithfulness. The next set of three is more specific, where Paul has become the object of mistreatment because of his faithfulness. He says that there were beatings, imprisonments, and riots. And we can read about some of the specific instances of that in the book of Acts, but even just from what Paul says in 2 Corinthians, we can see plainly that Acts is a limited history. Has it ever frustrated you when you're reading through the scriptures and like, I, I really want to know more about this? You know, there's, there's a couple of places in Acts where you go from one verse to the next and a span of years has passed. <laughs> Acts is not intended to be an exhaustive history of the start of the church. It's, it's uh, pointed. It's showing the progression of the church from Jerusalem to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And it's following, in particular, um, the ministry of Paul as he goes. There's, there's some theories about the book of Acts where they think that maybe Luke was writing it, where it was um, a, a document that could be presented at one of Paul's trials. Here's how Paul lived. Here's the evidence of him being a, a good citizen and not worthy of the imprisonment of the Roman Empire. And so it's, it's a pointed, it's a limited sort of history. But we can see beatings, imprisonment, and riots that occur because Paul went out faithfully serving God and serving the people that he was ministering to. He tells about more times he was attacked, other riots, other imprisonments, but he endured them in a godly way for Jesus' sake. The final set of three stems from his devotion to his missionary calling and work. Um, that is the list, excuse me, that um, is from verse 6 and following, um, or excuse me, verse 5 um, and following. He says, um, first one is hard work. Um, the word that's translated into English, hard work, it suggests this labor and, and toiling effort that brings on exhaustion. In, in Corinth and in Thessalonica, when Paul was ministering there, he supported himself by working instead of being supported by the church. Um, he says that it was, it was my, my right, it's a right thing. The scriptures say that the one who labors in the gospel should earn their living by the gospel. Don't uh, muzzle the ox while it treads out the grain. That's the teaching about it there. But Paul said to, for the sake of not burdening the church, for the sake of uh, making his witness um, to them in that situation more effective, he chose to work and support himself. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, he talks about working day and night, which might explain his next statement where he says that one of the ways he's commended himself as legitimate is through sleepless nights. He probably used the night hours to work at his trade, um, where he was ministering during the day and then working in the night hours, or maybe it was uh, the flip of that, where he worked during the day and then went out to preach at night because the people were also working during the day too. The next word that he uses um, which is translated hunger, is used throughout the New Testament for um, fasting. It, it may refer to the time he chose to pray and evangelize instead of um, eating. 
you know, choosing to go and minister that way. Or maybe it meant that he went hungry at times because he refused to accept the support of others. There was um, some conflict in, in Corinth where um, if he was supported by the church, it would kind of make him seem like a, a hireling. You know, that, oh, you, you know, we pay you. You just have to do what we say. And so he said, no, I'm, I'm not doing that for the sake of my ministry being more effective. Now, it's, it's important to note in all of this that having problems or people being against you does not commend us by itself. Everyone has problems. Everyone faces hardship. However, when you're going through these things, being faithful, enduring them commends us. Enduring them commends us. Everyone has hardships, and so hardships in life don't automatically prove faithfulness. But when hardships come as a result of our serving God, serving others, loving God, loving others, when hardships come because you live like a servant of God in your home, your school, your job, your HOA, your PTA, any other acronym that you want to come up with, when we endure those things, that does commend us. It's a strong proof of faithfulness. Hardships in all those areas come naturally. However, endurance in them doesn't. Endurance in those areas to those hardships shows something more. When, when Paul starts in this um, list back in, excuse me, in verse 4, he says, as servants of God, we commend ourselves to you in every way in great endurance. Skipping down a little bit to verses 8 through 10, he describes some more hardships, um, a little bit of a, a different category. These, these things don't always come in the most obvious packaging. Sometimes hardships don't necessarily look that way to those on the outside. It's hardships that come from the court of public opinion. They can be both when he was rejected and scorned and when he was lauded and approved. Let's look at verses 8 through 10. It says, Through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. We commend ourselves by our endurance through all of these things. Paul suffered um, insults in many places. He was ridiculed um, for his work, but he also sometimes had praises heaped on him. He was highly, highly regarded by the churches. There's also an example of the um, Lyconians where Paul came in he starts to preach, and it says that he and Barnabas were there, and the people respond, and they started worshiping them, thinking that they were Zeus and Hermes. That's a huge temptation. If, if people come out, and they're wanting to sacrifice a bull to you, they're heaping praises on you, they want to serve you and worship you like you're a god. I've read some tragic missionary reports back in the, the 1800s and the, the push into world missions, especially in the South Pacific, where missionaries go to some of these um, islands that had yet been unreached. Missionaries follow them some years later, and they find these people ruling like their deities instead of serving. Tragic. It's a danger and a temptation. Paul says that we endured those things as well. The Lyconians, they started worshiping Barnabas and Paul as gods in one moment, but then when Paul says, no, we're not these, and you need to depart from worshiping these foolish and false idols, the next moment the people are dragging Paul out of the city to stone him. But that didn't sway him from his calling. He endured that. He endured faithfully through fame and through abuse because he had a divine internal compass to help maintain his course and the humility when it swings in the responses to him from respect to shame. They're so dramatic from, from one point to the other. Insults didn't devastate him. Praise didn't puff him up. His desire to please only God kept him on the straight and narrow. 
And if the collective experiences of mankind um, teaches us anything, it's that prosperity and acclaim can actually be a more dangerous situation than that of poverty and ridicule. We, we've heard um, all, of course, these high-profile cases of you know, large churches and then the, the tragic fall into um, disrepute of, of leaders in it. That's what Paul endured, both on the normal kind of hardships that we'd say of, of poverty, of sickness, of rejection, but then some other maybe harder to identify hardships, things where it's a relational hardship, an emotional hardship, the, the temptation to stop relying on God because I have everything I need. Those are what Paul endured, but let's also ask, how was he enduring it? What, what gave him what he needed to endure? What, what's the manner? How did he go about the enduring of it? Was it with complaining and a grumpy, mopey kind of attitude? You know, we know that's not how it was. He tells us how he went about this endurance in verses 6 and 7. And as I read it, I think he lists both his manner of life, what he was doing in enduring, but I also think he lists how he had the power to endure. Let's look at verses 6 and 7. He says, In purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love, in truthful speech, and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left. So, so what are the qualities needed for us to endure hardship faithfully? How do we go about it? Well, he says, with, with purity, making sure that there's not a, a, a twisting, a spinning, that there's not a corruption going in, a purity, and an understanding. You know, one of, one of the things that I, I find in particular with my children is that um, I don't necessarily seek out uh, the the whole situation before I react as a father, right? I hear one kid crying, and so immediately I know the other one did something wrong, which isn't necessarily the case. Sometimes you just have whiny kids. So, <laughs> understanding, you know, going and seeking to understand what's going on. When the hardship comes, trying to look at it from all the angles. Patience. Um, the, the word that's most commonly used for patience in, in the New Testament, it means to, to bear under a weight. It's just to, to hold it, to hold it for a little bit longer. There was a, a Roman historian that said that the legions, Rome's legions, they conquered by patience, by endurance, by pressing on. With kindness, that's difficult in the face of hardship, isn't it? You know, especially if it's someone causing the hardship for you. He endured with kindness and with sincere love and truthful speech. Those aren't easy qualities to live out. Um, but whoever said that ease was what we were supposed to seek, right? Uh, there's so much that, that tends toward that, especially in a very opulent, luxurious, you know, rich kind of life, you know, this day and age and where we live. But how easy or hard something is, is not a measure of whether it's good or right. Living out those faithful, godly qualities oftentimes is very, very hard. And one of the reasons why it's hard is because it goes against my sinful heart's desires. And so I have to strive for what's right, what's good, what's best. Sometimes and often even in the face of what I want in the moment. So how did Paul do it? How, how do we get the strength to pursue those things, to, to choose to live with purity, with understanding, with patience, with kindness, with sincere love and truthful speech when those things aren't the easiest? And in the moment, in a really like sh narrow, short view, they're not always what we want to do. So how did Paul do it? How do we do it? The other things that he lists there, he says, we do it in the Holy Spirit, we do it in the power of God. We do it with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left hand. 
Um, I believe what he's saying there is th- this isn't a natural thing. We need a, a supernatural response to this. We need a, a supernaturally natural response in us where the Holy Spirit in us is working. The power of God is with us to um, give us the strength we need for this. And then the weapons of righteousness in the right hand and the left. And the idea there is that you, you have something, you have a tool from God, the weapons of righteousness in the right hand and the left for, for both sides, not a shield on one and a weapon on the other. You got weapons in both. I would I paraphrase it this way. How do we do this? How do we find the strength to endure with God's presence, with God's power, and with all the tools that God provides? Now, where does this come from? Where do we get the presence of God for us? Where do we find the power of God for us? And, and what are the tools that God provides? All of this comes through the gospel. One of the most, um, one of the most impactful things that um, I came across as I was studying through the scripture, as I was ministering in, in my thinking about what Christians need, came in Romans chapter one, where Paul is writing to a church and he says to them, I earnestly desire to come and preach the gospel to you. We never graduate from needing the gospel. It's not something that I believed to become saved and now I move on to something else. The gospel is this, you have favor from God because you are found in his son. We never get beyond needing that. God sent his son into the world to live the life that we should. He took our place. He was our substitution, lived the life that we should, but then also voluntarily went and bore the penalty, the punishment that we deserve for our failure to live for God's glory. Took that penalty, fully paid it, rose again from the dead by the power of God, so that now he ever lives to make intercession for us, so that everyone who puts their faith in him is forgiven of their sins, reconciled to God, brought into his family, and we have all that we need in him. Just like it says in Romans chapter 8, God who, who gave his son did not spare his son, how shall he not with him, with Jesus, also freely give us all things? We have all that we need in him, and that's gospel, 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 gospel. It's not, I've read more, I churched more, I prayed more, all of these things, and so now God will give me something else. God's love, his mercy, and his abundance is overflowing. He's glorifying himself that way by showing his greatness, his ability, his providence, by giving us what we need, not because we've earned it, not because we've traded with him for something. I'll give you a little bit of my righteousness and you give me a little bit of forgiveness. It's not that. The gospel is giving all of this and Paul lives in that It says, God, give me what I need so that whatever I endure in this life, I can press on and draw closer to him. In Philippians, he says that he desires to share even in the sufferings of Jesus so that he can know him more deeply, more thoroughly. The gospel frees us to endure hardship because it gives us a connection to God. When, when Jesus, in his high priestly prayer, is explaining what eternal life is, in John chapter 17, he says, this is eternal life, that they know you, Father, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. To believe the gospel, to be saved by the gospel, is to truly know, experientially and relationally, God. And so if, if you believe the gospel, if you're a Christian, God gives you himself. And so we have the presence of God with us. And he says that I will provide all your needs along with him. And so we have the power of God with us. And then he's placed us into the body of Christ. And he works in providence so that he gives us the tools that we need to serve him. The strength that comes through grace, the help of other Christians with us, and the opportunity to go out and serve him within the body of Christ and out with those who don't know him. And so he gives us what we need in the gospel to live this life of endurance. He gives us the strength, the foundation, so that we can have thick skin to get through what comes to us in this fallen, sinful, broken life. But not just callousness to go through it like a stoic, 
thick skin and tender hearts so that we don't lose our love for the people that we're interacting with in these hardships. I, I want to illustrate this um, with two stories that I heard that just really powerfully elucidate this concept for us. I heard these stories as a, a part of a conference message really um, years ago, and it, it stuck so, so much with me. I, I think they will thoroughly encourage um, you as well. The first one comes from J. Oswald Sanders. Um, he wrote a couple of books, or multiple books. He, he wrote many, many books, but three that are, are most, um, that I've read that have been most helpful to me. There's uh, spiritual leadership, spiritual maturity, and spiritual discipleship, this sort of trilogy of books that were very, very helpful. He told the story of an indigenous missionary um, in India. He would walk barefoot from village to village preaching the gospel um, his hardships were many. India is not a hospitable place to Christian ministry. Um, after long days of, of many miles walking, discouragement of rejection and people not understanding, he told that this, this missionary came to a, a certain village and he tried to speak the gospel to the people there, but he was driven out of town, rejected. They didn't want to hear it. And so he went out to the edge of the village, dejected, discouraged, lay down under a tree and just fell asleep from exhaustion. Um, he told about how when this missionary woke up, he found the people of the village hovering around him, and he was terrified because he thought he was going to be attacked. You know, it's not beyond the, the scope of possibility for him. He says he found the whole town gathered around him, and they, they said, we, we're, we're willing to listen to you now. We're willing to hear you speak. The, the elder, the head man of the village, explained that when someone came out, they saw him and they saw the bottom of his feet while he was lying down out there by the tree. And they saw his blistered, bruised, cracked feet. And they concluded then, he must be a holy man because if he walked on those feet to come and tell us, then there must be something in his message worthwhile. And they said then as a response, seeing that, they said it would have been evil to reject him and that they were sorry and that they wanted to hear his message now because if he was willing to suffer so much for them, they would listen. So the evangelist, as he was going out, he is filling up the afflictions of Jesus like it says in um, Colossians that um, the whole world, Jesus did everything that was necessary for the salvation of the world, but not everyone saw it. And so that's what we do. We get to go out and show that in our lives and in our speech. And so his beautiful blistered feet commended him to the people. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who publishes peace, who bring news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7. And so he went, and the people saw this. They saw what he endured, thick skin, tender heart, and then they listened. The second story, um, incredibly impactful, is I was, I was in tears listening to it the first time, is a story of a, a Maasai warrior named Joseph. Um, the Maasai is a, a people group in Africa. They're known for... Um, their rite of passage where the young men of this people, they have to go and they have to kill a lion. And that's their rite of passage. And so they're, they're known for being exceptionally tough. And he goes, and the, the speaker that I heard this story from said that the story is originally told by Michael Card in a 1991 edition of Virtue Magazine. I, I, I don't think it's around anymore. I'm not sure it's being published and I've never read it, but that's, that's where if you want to try and research it out. Here's, here's how it goes. Um, Joseph of this Maasai, the Maasai tribe, he was out walking along these hot, you know, dusty African roads, and he met with someone who shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with him. And then and there, he accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And in the power of the Spirit, his life was transformed. And instead of continuing on with his journey, he wanted to go back to his own village and share this good news with the members of his, the, the local tribe of the people. 
And so he went back to his village and he began going door to door, telling everyone about the cross, the suffering of Jesus and the salvation that it offered. And he was expecting their faces to light up the way his had. And to his amazement, the villagers did not only not care about what he was saying, but they responded violently to him. The men of the village grabbed him and held him to the ground while the women of the village beat him with strands of barbed wire. He was dragged out from the village and left to die out in the bush. Somehow he managed to crawl to a water hole and there, after days of passing in and out of consciousness, he found the strength to get up and he wondered at the hostile reception that he had received from people he had known all his life. He decided that he must have left something out of the story or told it wrong because there's no way people would respond that way to the message that he heard. And so he worked through his mind, rehearsing more and more what the evangelist, the missionary, the Christian that shared with him, what did they say? How did they say it? And so he decided to go back to his village and share his faith once more. And so he limped into the circle of huts and he began to proclaim Jesus. He died for you so that you might find forgiveness and come to know the living creator God. He pleaded with them. And again, he was grabbed by the men of the village and held down and the women beat him, reopening his wounds that had just begun to heal. And once more, they dragged him unconscious from the village and left him to die. To have survived the first beating is remarkable. To live through the second is miraculous. And again, days later, he woke up in the wilderness, bruised, scarred, and determined to go back again. And so he returned to his small village, and this time they attacked him even before he had the chance to open his mouth. They flogged him for the third and probably the last time, He spoke to them while this is happening about Jesus Christ, the Lord. And before he passed out, he said that the last thing that he remembered was the women who were beating him beginning to weep. This time he woke up days later in his own bed. And the ones who were trying to kill him, severely beating him, these same ones were now trying to save his life and nurse him back to health the entire village had come to Christ. Thick skin, tender heart. These two emphases, thick skin, tender heart, and the hope that the gospel gives us, the strength that the gospel gives us to endure, that's the power to righteously endure hardship. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15 says this, Since the children have flesh and blood, Jesus, he too, shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. God in the gospel has given us the strength to go through what might cost so much, what might result in earthly loss. And he's given us this, where we can go and choose to live a life that might bring these things. Or or when it comes through no fault of our own, there's some things where hardship just comes and it's totally unrelated to what we do. But how do we go through that? There... Um, there was a, an elder at the church I served with before um, here who was a, a school teacher in the high school. And um, he, he shared with us one day about um, a student of his who was um, talking with him. And it just came out in, in conversation. I don't know exactly how, but he explained that the, the week prior, his father had passed away. And he says, I'm you know, sad, but you know, thankfully... You know, I, I, have, I have Christ, you know, and he comforts me. My father knew him, and so I, I'm comforted. And the, the student's response to him was, that would have wrecked my life. You know, I, I, that, that would have destroyed me. I don't understand how you can be composed. And he said, well, I'm, it's, it's because I have Christ. It's because God is with me. And the student said, well, I'm a Christian too. I just, I don't get it. And he said, oh, 
Hmm. And he was able to, to talk and minister to that kid, and that, that child was able to, to start examining themselves a little bit more. Am I relying on this Jesus that I, I say I believe in? You know, am, I, am I trusting in him, or am I trusting in my own strength, my own ability? Because my, my skin's not that thick. <laughs> my heart's not that tender. But Christ, in his love and his strength, and trusting that he is in control over all things, he has a billion different ways where he can craft what occurs. And it's in his strength and his power that he can work to change hearts. That thickens my skin. That softens my heart. And it can be the same for all of us as we rely on him, on God who holds all things in his hands. Amen, church? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, that you would work in us that we would be those that respond to you and we see the faithfulness of others and we, we don't use worldly estimations and values and end up rejecting faithful servants. I uh, pray that you would also work in us so that we are those faithful servants. That when we see um, people in need, that we would open our hearts wide to them. And that even if there isn't the response, Lord, that we would continue on loving that we continue on in faithfulness to you, just as you opened your heart wide to us. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the testimony of these faithful people, your servant Paul, a missionary in India, Joseph, the Messiah. Father, please use these things to spur us on to more faithfulness, that we would strategically live for you and make good use of all that you've provided for us. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. And thank you that our acceptance from you and the strength to serve you is found in your gospel out of the abundance of your great love, not from us. Lord, we, we trust you. We rely on you. And as we sing your praises now, as we have a time to support the work of the ministry here, uh, Father, please work in our hearts to do this and to accomplish this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.